Thank you, Kaka. We've got here um, three sheets. Uh, I'll just give you a breakdown before we start. Revelation 13, chiastic connections. That'll be the first one we use. And then we will be using this one here, which is Revelation 13, 11 to 18. That will be the second one we'll be using for marking. So look, I'd really encourage you to get yourself some coloured pens because learning involves all of our senses, huh? not just memory, but if we can visualise material and see it, it's much easier to retain it. So that's why we are giving these handouts for marking. It's so you can actually see connections and it's easier to... It's easier to remember scripture basically that way. Well, thank you. We've had prayer, so we'll get started. What we're doing this afternoon is we're going into Revelation chapter 13, 11 to 17, okay? Which deals with the activities of the second beast. Now, I haven't dealt with the identity. I'll come back to that a little bit later. But I want us to look at the activities of the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Now, what really is important when we're doing Revelation is not to get lost in a small passage, but it's to see first that passage in its relationship to other passages. Are we clear on this? That's why we're dealing a lot with structure to see how one part relates to another. And so what we're going to do first this afternoon is we're going to look at these verses, Revelation 13, 11 to 18, and see how it's related to other parts of Scripture. And then once we've seen the big picture, the forest, we'll start going in and looking at the individual plants. We'll look at the trees. Are we okay on this? All right, just so you know. Now, these are the connections. Revelation chapter 13, 11 to 17. And so, as I've said, we want to establish the connections because it's important. It guides us in our interpretation of Scripture. And if out of this series of studies you were to get nothing else but the pattern of the relationships, then you'd be able to do a lot of work on Revelation yourself within that, basically within that um, framework. So we're going to revise first the connection with Revelation chapter 12. We did this a few weeks ago. Um, but we're just going to look at it again. Then we're going to see how these verses are connected to Revelation chapter 13, 1 to 10. That is, how is the second beast connected to the first beast? We okay on this? Mm -hmm. In this one, what are we looking at? We're looking at the relationship between the persecution periods in chapter 12 and the persecutors in chapter 13. So we get that just fresh in our minds. Then we look at how the second beast is connected to the first. And then I want to look at the internal connections within this. And guess what we'll be using? We'll be looking at chiasms. And we'll be looking at, remember we do it with Hebrew parallel statements? We'll be looking at parallelisms too. So this will establish the relationships. You'll find... And I'm jumping a bit ahead, but this is a chiastic relationship between chapter 13, 11 to 17 and Revelation 13, 1 to 10, chiastic. And then within those verses, we've got parallel statements, parallelisms. Okay, so you're, you're roughly aware of it. We'll see it as we, as we work. So first, connection with Revelation chapter 12. Remember chapter 12? What's it contain? Two periods of persecution. Okay. And so we have a first period where the dragon, he's the actor, the main actor here, he drives the woman where? Into the wilderness for how long? Yeah. Okay, 1,260 days, years, plus it's also expressed as time times and half a time. So that's the first period of persecution and that's followed by a second one. And the second one is where the dragon goes off 
stands on the sands of the sea and starts to get ready for the war on the rest of the woman's offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So by now I'm hoping that that framework's clear in your mind. Huh? You look at chapter 12, open it, and the first thing you think of is two periods of persecution. First period, 1260 years, three and a half times, reflects the time of Elijah in the wilderness. Remember this? Okay, followed by a second period of persecution which will lead into the second coming. And that's in verse 17, the last verse in the chapter. Now, just something interesting about this. When we look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, which is leading into this first period of persecution, I just want you to notice something here. It says, Woe to you, O earth and sea. Remember the war in heaven? Devil cast down. And then right at the end of this section, there is a song. Rejoice, O ye in the heavens, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now I want to look at that word wrath because we skipped over this last time. But this is what it is. Uh, and then with the second one, chapter 12, 17, the dragon is making war on the woman's offspring. But notice the dragon became furious with the woman. So you've got these two words, wrath associated with the first period. We're clear on this? And fury associated with the second and sometimes you might think those two words are the same, but they're not. They're different in the Greek scriptures. They're different. The word for wrath here, great wrath, is thumos. Now, I'm not trying to turn you into Greek speakers, but I'm just wanting to whet your appetite here. Because thumos in Greek is a boiling up of emotion. You know, it's when you suddenly just get absolutely filled with anger. It just boils up inside you. It's an instantaneous response to something. We're clear on this? So in chapter 12, the dragon, this is what he's experiencing. This boiling up of emotions, fury, anger. Why? Because he knows his time is short. And so when he's cast out of heaven... And he realizes his time short. He's just absolutely furious with the fact. And in that boiling up of emotions inside, because the devil's got emotions, he turns his attention on the church because he can no longer touch the sun because the sun is at the right hand of God in heaven. And so that's what we've got. But when we come down here to this final conflict, just notice this. The word furious is not thumos, but it is orge. And what is orge? Orge is a settled anger. It's not that boiling emotions, but it is an attitude of anger. A consistent attitude of anger. And so the thumos has settled down to this anger that seeks what? Seeks revenge and desires to harm. So now he's being driven by the settled anger against the woman and he turns his attention on the remnant of a seed. So folks, this is what God's people at the end will be facing. The dragon. Not the boiling up of emotion which is hot, boils up and maybe evaporates, but this is a settled attitude of anger that's aiming at the destruction of those he's, he, he's hating. So that's what we're going to be facing in the last days. It's the dragon with a settled attitude of anger that seeks revenge because he knows his time short and has just become a whole part of him, a solid part of him, and it's going to be motivating him in the last days. Not the emotions, but the attitude. Deep-rooted hatred and anger because he's coming right to the end of time, isn't he? Yeah. And he knows the time's coming, when he is going to find himself swimming in the lake of fire. And so he wants to do all he can to revenge and to pay back Christ by dealing with the remnant of the woman's 
seed. And so that's chapter 12. These two periods, great periods of persecution, two great attempts where the devil throws everything into the field in order to destroy God's church. First time he fails. And so he's got nothing left now, but in this settled attitude of fury and anger, he now turns his attention on the remnant at the end and seeks to carry out revenge and harm them. And so that's Revelation chapter 12, the two periods of persecution. Now chapter 13, I want you to notice this. Chapter 13, we've got the two beasts, one from the sea, followed by one from the land. The first um, beast, the sea beast, makes war on the saints for 42 months. And I've highlighted that colour because the 42 months is the same time period as the 1260 days. Do you remember we looked at this? We looked at chapter 11 and looked at the parallel statements, huh? Because that ties the two together. And so that's what we get. The first persecutor, the sea beast, is carrying out the first period of persecution. And the second persecutor, the land beast, the one that comes up out of the land, he's the one who's going to make war on the rest of the woman's offspring. And so if we want to know about the second period of persecution, if we want the details, where do we go? We go here, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 to 17. We're clear on this, because we've covered this already. That's just reviewing it to make sure it's clear. So chapter 12 and verse 17. Poor South New Zealand Conference. Chapter 12 and verse 17. We've got one colour at least. Chapter 12, 17. Plants the seed. And then this is going to be elaborated. The war on the remnant is elaborated and expanded in chapter 13, 11 to 17. I say 17 because verse 18 is just throwing in a puzzle right at the end for John's readers. It's like a riddle. Okay, and so that's what we have. The second persecutor, the land beast, is going to be the one who carries out the second period of persecution. We all right? The second beast, which is the lamb-like beast. Yeah, yep, that's good. It um, says he causes as many as would not worship the image to be killed. And so that's what he's doing. That's a war on the remnant right at the end of time. So these verses are quite relevant, huh? Because we look in the stream of history and what's behind us? The first period of persecution. It's finished. And what lies in front of us? second period so there we are between the two and what God is doing here is he's showing his servants what must soon take place you remember those words and so he's showing us what must soon take place so that when it happens we will recognize the events and it's for our protection like a father or a mother warns the son or the daughter don't do this because it's dangerous and lays it out. So what the Lord is doing here is in the revelation of Jesus Christ, he's laying out the devil's plans in these verses. We clear on that? Mm -hmm. The plans of the devil, so that when the devil tries to carry out the plans, he's going to fail. Because we will recognize the power behind it. Why? Because we know the word of God. Clear? So this is absolutely crucial for Christians in the last days. Every church member should be aware of this because this is going to be the protection in the last days. You remember in Egypt, Moses threw a stick on the ground and what happened? It, it turned into a snake. And what did the, what did the um, magicians of Pharaoh do? Exactly the same. And so you see, you can't go on sight 
You've got to be able to evaluate. And the only way we will be able to evaluate is by our understanding of the word. That's really the importance of this. This is why you're prepared to devote 40 weeks and I'm prepared to devote 40 plus weeks in preparation of materials because this is absolutely crucial for every Seventh-day Adventist. Absolutely. It shouldn't be just an option because in the last days when we stand before courts and are asked to give answers for the things that we are saying and we are examined, it's on the basis of the Bible that we'll be able to defend ourselves. Only on the basis of the word will we be able to defend ourselves. So what we're doing here week by week is actually preparation for the final crisis. That's what it is. It's preparation for the final crisis. That's why I'm hoping you're able to put some time during the week into consolidation as we, basically as we move. Okay. So last point. This is laying out the battle plans of the dragon so we know what is going to happen and how the dragon is going to get into the position of making war on the rest of her offspring. Really important, huh? Battle plans. Because I tell you, any battle that takes place, the leaders of opposing sides would love the battle plans of their enemy because then they know how to arrange their forces to protect themselves. And so that's what's uh, crucial about what we're doing this afternoon. We're going to be looking at the battle plans of the, of the dragon. Okay, on this? All right. Now I want to look, and you'll take your first sheet. That's your first sheet, which is on the chiastic connections, and this is where you'll do some marking. I want to compare Revelation chapter 13, 3 to 6. Chapter 13, 3 to 6. That's in your first column. And we're going to compare this with the section that deals with the activities, introduces the activities of the first beast. Second beast. Are we all right? We know where we're going? Okay. So if you've got some colors, this will be really helpful. And you can mark it as we go. Now, verse 3, one of its heads, have a look at verse 3. You got it? In scripture? It says, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was what? It was healed. Mark that in one color, just those words. I've colored them on the PowerPoint so that you can find it fairly easy. So verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. Good. You'll need another color in a few moments. Because we're going to move on, and it goes on and says, and the whole earth, you see that in your text? The whole earth, just mark those words in color, marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the beast, the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they what? They worshipped the beast. And so this is telling us the whole earth is going to worship the beast. When? After... Its mortal wound is healed. So resurrection leads to the whole world worshipping the beast. Uh, it'll, this will become clear to us as we move on and we look at Scripture. You'll find what Scripture says about this. Not what I say about it, but what Scripture says. So we okay on this? And then comes a third point in verse 5 and you'll need a third colour. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and it was allowed to what? Exercise authority. authority. Don't worry about the 42 months at this stage, but the words exercise the authority, those are the important words. Exercise the authority. And so there we've got the flow. Huh? Mortal wound healed, the whole earth worships the beast. And this beast has actually been exercising the authority of the dragon because he gets his authority from the dragon for 42 months. Are we all right? We can see that flow of thought in those verses? Yep. That's verses 3 down to 5. We've looked at those already. 
Now I want to switch over to the other column to look at the activities of the second beast. And I want you to notice verse 12. So the last color you use to mark is the color you'll need because now we've got the first beast and what's he doing? Exercising authority. So this is in chapter 13, verse 12. Chapter 13, verse 12. I think you get verse 12, find verse 12, and just mark the words, it exercises all the authority. Uh, the same color as you marked your last one, exercises authority in verse 5, is it? Yeah. And now use the same because you're starting to see the pattern of the words. That's verse 12. And verse 12, notice the next part. And he w does what? Makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Now use the same color as you've used for marking the beast being worshipped in that first part. You used yellow. There. There. Same verse. And it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. It'll become clear in a minute. And then the last part is this. Who's what? Mortal wound was healed. And so what do you want to do now? You want to mark that with the same color that you used first. And, and folks, you should notice something. Do you notice anything in the pattern? Yeah. You notice it matches, doesn't it, huh? Between the two sides. Can you see it? You haven't got colours. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it reverses the order. What we've actually got is a chiasm between those verses in chapter 13, verse 1 to 10, and chapter 13, verse 12. Now, I put it here. This is, this is the one you want to take a photo of. This is it. So there is chapter 13, verse 3, down to verse 5. There's three parts, but notice when we come into verse 12. Verse 12. Do you see that? You see him reversing the order? So he's tying the two together. So chapter 13, chapter 13, 3 to 5 is related to chapter 13, 11, 12. We okay on this? That's the connection I want you to see. Because what chapter 13, 11 following is going to be doing is expanding verses 3 to 5. You following? He's planting the seed here, but now he's going to be developing it. And this is all going to happen through the activity of the second beast. He's the one who's going to exercise the authority of the first beast in his presence. He's the one who's going to make the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. He's the one who will heal the mortal wound of the first beast. But the, the interesting is that that uh, the word is here, it's just like the, the beast also has this resurrection. Yeah, just like Christ, because that first beast is the unholy son, remember in the counterfeit trinity? Yeah. Okay, so you've got, that's right, you've got that relationship, we've already touched on it. Are we okay on this? Yeah. Because what I'm going to do now is we're going to go through this and we're going to tie the parts together and then you'll begin to see clearly what the dragon's up to but we're doing it on the basis of scripture you following this mm -hmm. i want what we do here to come out of the bible not to come out of my mouth yeah. because that's the only way that we can be strong as christians when our beliefs are not founded on what other people are saying but they're founded on the mm -hmm. the word so that's important so what you should be doing critically and analytically 
is saying, is Kavanaugh sticking to the Bible or is Kavanaugh the devil's agent who's leading us astray? And the only way you can make a decision is by re-examining what we say and saying, well, is it biblical? Is it coming out of the word or is it just coming out of Kavanaugh's mouth? And if it's just coming out of my mouth, be careful. But if it's coming out of my mouth and it's based on solidly on the word, then you can say, okay, this is what the word says and that's what I want to do. I want to teach you scripture. Yeah? Okay. And so that's why we're going through this. I could just come in and tell you all the points and you could go away and learn them, but I want you to understand why and how we're making those, those points. That's the important thing. So we're going to go back over this. You've got the pattern. So what I'm going to do is we're going to look at this and then we're going to look at this and then we're going to tie it all together. And then we'll go on to our third connection, which will make it, which will make it, I hope, will make it clear. And so there it is. Those are the verses that we're going to look at. These ones. So the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. And this tells us about the authority of the second beast. So we're just going to look at this verse. Verse 12. We okay? Um, and we'll notice a number of things. The first thing we'll notice is when we look at this verse here, it's got two parts to it. It's got two parts to it. The second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and there are two aspects or two parts to it. Can you see what the two parts are? What are the two parts? Yeah. First aspect is he's going to exercise all the authority of the first beast. We're clear on this? And the second aspect is in its presence. So we just keep those two parts in mind. Huh? Now, this is giving us a time aspect. When does the second beast exercise his authority? Well, he does it in the presence of the first beast. Okay. Now, remember this. This is the background. What do we have in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17? The dragon, he's angry with the woman. Thank you. The dragon, he's angry with the woman and he goes off to make war on the remnant of her seed. So this is chapter 12 and verse, ah, perfect. Chapter 12 and verse 17, thank you. And so he goes off to make war on the rest of her offspring. We're clear on that, huh? Now, where does he go? And he went and stood where? He goes and he stands on the sand of the beach or the sand of the sea. So that's where he goes. This is all in chapter 12, verse 17. Now, what happens when he's standing on the sand of the sea? Come on, you're thinking back. We looked at this earlier, much, much earlier. Thank you. There, on the sand of the sea, remember we looked at a map? Mm -hmm. And we saw the dragon, he'd come across from here, across to wilderness to the beach, and he's joined by the sea beast. So up comes the sea beast. Now, when does this take place? When is the dragon standing on the sand of the sea and when is he joined by the sea beast? I'm thinking about the sequence of events that we've got in Revelation chapter 12 and 13. Now look, I, I'm doing this because often we don't think about it from this perspective and we miss a point, a really important point. It's when he's 
getting ready to make war on the remnant. Exactly. So this is, when does he go off? After the first period of persecution's finished. Are we clear? So this is after the first period of persecution's finished. That's when he goes off, stands on the sands of the sea, getting ready to make war on the rest of the woman's offspring. So this is the period we're talking about. It's a period between the persecutions. First period's finished. Second period lies ahead. He's getting ready for this. Are we okay? So what is the state of the sea beast? He's wounded. Look at chapter 13 and verse 14, the last part. Chapter 13, verse 14. I'm jumping ahead of my PowerPoint, but that's okay. Chapter 13 and verse 14. Good. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which was allowed to perform and he deceives them into what? To the beast. Now here's the beast that was what? Wounded. And yet? Aha, uh -huh, so that's him. He's living, but he's wounded. Are we clear on this? So he's standing now on the sand of the sea and out crawls this wounded beast, this beast with a wound on his head, but he's still living. Yeah, we got that. This is what we miss when we just jump quickly over the words without looking through the arrangement. We okay on this? Okay. Now let me catch up. Dragon goes off to make war, stands on the sands of the sea, this is after the close of the first period of persecution. Good. Before the opening of the second period of persecution. Okay, because he's doing this straight after. He's going to get ready for the war on the remnant. So he stands on the sands of the sea and he calls out the second, the first beast. And he's getting ready to make the war. He's not making it. He's getting ready for it. And out comes the second, the first beast, joins him between the persecutions, and he's wounded by the sword, yet lives. In other words, he lives, he's alive, but he's unable to persecute. His 42 months are over. They're finished. So you're looking at least 200 years of this sort of... Well, I'm not worrying too much about the time because all I want really is the sequence of the events of Revelation. You're following? Um, but you're asking valid questions that every Seventh-day Adventist would ask those kind of questions. But I, I'm, I'm looking at the picture, trying to recreate the picture of what John saw. The second was born when Jesus was on the cross. Uh, we're talking about, you're talking about the dragon. No, I'm not, we're not talking about the dragon. We're talking about the sea beast. Are we clear on what we're saying here? John. First of all, you're, you're taking all the filters off in my ear and just reading the Bible. Here. That's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see. Because, no, to be honest, as a result of this seminar, the filters are coming off from me too. And sometimes something that was planted years ago, yeah. it's now starting, the filters are going and it's starting to make sense. And that's what I want us to be able to do, drop the filters and just focus on the picture we get in the Word. And look, I tell you, it's powerful. This to me is really powerful when we see this. Because I didn't realize that beast out of the water still has this mortal wound in it. No, we didn't. Uh, no, that's exactly right. Mm. But, th but that's, that's the state he's in when he comes and he stands on the sands of the sea beside the dragon and the dragon looks at him and says, hey, we've got to fix this up. We've got to get this back on track. Yeah? yeah? How is the beast from the water? Come on. <laughs> Come on. You know this. It's the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. Okay. Then the dragon, between the persecution periods, joined first by the sea beast. We got that? He's wounded by the sword yet lived. He's alive, unable to persecute. persecute. Now the dragon's joined... Second, by the land beast. 
Are we clear? And the land beast stands in the presence of the wounded sea beast. And so now he's got, on the right hand, he's got the land beast, and on the left hand, I'm assuming it's the left hand, he's got the wounded sea beast. And he says, and we've got to get things together because we've got another period of persecution coming up and I'm not going to lose this one. And so what's he going to do? He's going to use the second beast to heal the deadly wound of the first beast. And when that's healed, that's when the war on the remnant so will basically so begin. The well, yes, but we haven't established that yet. That's one of your filters just dropped into place. <laughs> that's good. No, that's good. That's okay, because we, 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 will, establish, we will establish it. The first beast, the first beast is the half, uh, half of you, right? It's so the little horn, yeah. yeah little horn I, I say little horn because I want to be gentle here. We all know what we're talking about, yeah? Mm. Okay. Now we come to the other aspect. Remember, this is just the first one. There was two aspects to verse 12, remember? exercises all the authority of the first beast that's the first aspect in his presence and we've looked at in his presence and now we're going to switch back the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast now what does that mean what does that mean aha uh -huh. now have a look at it here it is we've just gone back to the chiasm how has the first beast, where did the authority of the first beast come from? Good, exactly. So that's the first thing we know, <laughs> that the dragon is the one who's standing with his two mates and he's authorised the first beast to persecute for the 42 months. We clear on this? And now he's going to enable the second beast to exercise the authority of the first beast in his presence. But notice this. So it comes from the dragon, 13.2, but how did he exercise it? How did this beast exercise his authority? Come on, read it. It's here. Yeah, but it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Now, what did it do when it's exercising its authority for 42 months? What's it doing? Exactly, it's persecuting. It's persecuting. And so that's the important thing. He exercises it, he makes war on the saints in chapter 13, 5 to 7. He persecutes God's people. So when the second beast exercises the authority of the first beast, what's he going to do? Exactly, now you're starting to get it. And you see, we're not guessing at this, but we're letting Scripture... Interpret scripture. We're allowing it to interpret itself. We're just by looking at the relationships. We okay? Mm -hmm. So all we've done is we've looked at this first beast in its presence. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we saw in its presence, the presence of the first beast, the first beast is wounded. Yet alive. It can't persecute. And the second beast comes along and he's going to exercise the same authority the first beast exercised. But how does he exercise? What authority does the first beast, the second beast, ex first beast exercise? He exercised authority for 42 months by making war on the remnant, uh, on the saints and overcoming them, it says in chapter 13, first part. Are we okay? And so the second beast... This is what he's going to do. In the presence of that wounded first beast, he's going to exercise the authority that the beast had before by persecuting. Wow. And so now we're starting to get the dynamics of the story, the dynamics of the story straight. So when the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast, what does he do? He persecutes. He persecutes. Are we okay? And then we come to the last part. We look at the... the part where he persecutes. Sorry? 
Because yes, he does. We know all this, but we're not interested in that at the moment. We're interested in this. We're focusing on the events of Revelation chapter 13. We don't want to be diving all over the place. So when the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast, what does he do? He makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Are we clear on this? He makes them. So this, he makes the earth and its inhabitants. When it exercises the authority of the first beast, it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. And how does it do that? By persecution. Make, causes, force, pressure. That's what's behind that word. Huh? Not gentle encouragement, mm. but the hard fist mm. is going to come. And in that hard fist, are we okay on this so far? Mm. What you need to do this week, even later on after, you know, before Sabbath goes out, is go back through these verses and just read them until you see the connections coming together yourself. You follow? You've got to be able to visualize it. You're not memorizing notes, but you're looking at the text until it falls into place and suddenly it just jumps out of the pages and then you got it. Because then you can take the Bible, open it, read the passage and the meanings just jump out. Jump out of the passages. And Without that's... Filters. Sorry? Without filters. Without filters. <laughs> without filters but you find this fairly powerful isn't it when you start to get the the picture clear and I appreciate your comment about the filters because I think that's an excellent way of expressing what we are trying to do so he makes the earth inhabitants worship the first beast this is enforced this worship of the first beast is enforced through persecution through persecution and in that act of exercising the authority of the first beast in its presence, he causes the whole world to worship the first beast. And that's when the mortal wound is healed. That's the healing of the mortal wound. So we've let scripture, I hope, we're starting to let scripture just unfold itself. This is what we've been trying to do since the first period we spent together. Yeah. Yeah, then because the mortal wound uh, healed because of the whole world worship. No, that, that is. That is the healing of the wound. The healing of the wound is when the whole world worships mm. the first beast, but it does it through the second beast exercising all the authority, mm. being energized, empowered, guided, directed by the dragon. Mm. That's what brings it together. Yeah, John. So when the um, second beast exercises authority and persecutes the saints and forces the world to worship now the first beast, you're saying that that heals the mortal wound, right? Yes. And now we have first beast coming back into power. Would that be uh, we have double whammy <coughs> at that stage? And then what happened to the second beast? And so now, are you talking about current events? No, no, I'm just talking in Bible here. Ah. <laughs> so, so, so what I'm seeing here is that there is, we're going to get uh, a live first beast, not, not during us. Yes. A second beast with immense power, which, which heals the mortal wound. Yeah. So don't we then get a super whammy of the first beast now in power? Now that it's healed? That's very good. That's very good. And I think we'll see that in chapter 13. Chapter 13, because we've got to look at a third connection here. Because the power of the papacy of the past has been to the civil authorities, is it? Without the civil authorities, it couldn't good. be. Good. Very good mm -hmm. comment. Ab mm -hmm. Absolutely very good comment. And uh, you might want to read quietly for yourself chapter 13 and verse 15. And you've got it. You've got it there in Scripture. You have. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, I want to look at the third connection, and this will tie it all together, I think, I hope. Uh, you'll take the second sheet, the second sheet that you've got for marking, the second sheet that you've got for marking. That's 13, 11 to 18. So these are just our worksheets so we can kind of visualize for ourselves. Huh? Um, 
I want you to notice chapter 13, verse 12. This seems to me to be the key verse because this is the verse that connects back to chapter 13, 5 to 7. Clear on this? Or oh, it's three to, 3 to 5, is it? 13, 3 to 5. But it also is connecting us to verses 13 to 17, what follows. You clear on what I'm saying? This verse is a bridge and it's going to be explained in verses 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17. And I just want you to see the connection between the two. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, so we go back to chapter 13, verse 12. Uh, exercises all the first beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. It makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So three parts to it, really. Three steps, yeah? In verse 12. Okay. So that's going to connect us. Now, let's move. Chapter 13, verse 12. First part of verse 12. I should have done this in colour. I'm sorry, I kind of ran out of time to revise. In the presence of the sea beast, it exercises the authority of the sea beast, which comes from the dragon. We've seen that. And it's through that exercise this mortal wound is going to be healed. Now, what does it do in the next part? By exercising the authority, it performs, of the dragon, it performs great signs. Are we clear? Verse 13. Just read verse 13, have a look. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. And verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs which is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. Now, please mark those words, one color, in the presence of the beast. That's in verse 14. And mark the same words in verse 12. Have you got that? Verse 12 talks about exercise authority of the first beast in its presence. You got that? Do that on the second sheet. Oh, okay. Now, when we move on into verse 14, 13 and 14, by the signs it's allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. You got that? So verse 13 and 14 are actually um, developing on the exercising the authority of the first beast in its presence. You following? So it exercises the authority of the first beast in its presence and what does it do? It performs great signs. Even making fire come down from heaven in front of people. And what are the signs for? What do the signs do? They deceive, they're deceptive. The fire from heaven is deceptive. And what's the point of the deception? What's the point of the deception? Yeah, now read scripture. Just read the words. Read the words. Yeah. He sets up, it says there, telling them to make an image to the beast. Have you got that? Mm -hmm. That was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And so here we get great signs. We get great signs. And what do the signs do? They deceive people into what? Setting up an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So that's the first step in the dragon's program. He works great signs. And the great signs that are being worked in the second beast 
are going to enable it to deceive people into setting up what's called an image to the beast. We're clear? And then you go into verse 15. Have a look at verse 15. Just read verse 15. It says, And it was allowed to give breath. So the image of the beast is given breath. Who gives it breath? The sea beast. Sorry, the land beast, yeah? Are we clear on this? So the land beast, here it is, the land beast, Verse 13, performance of great signs. The great signs are deceptive. And what do they lead to? A setting up of the image to the beast that was slain by the sword and yet lived. And once that's set up, he moves into the next phase, the next step, which is he gives breath to the image. And what does the image do? It speaks. And when it speaks, what happens? It causes those who would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Slain. You clear on this? So he gives breath to the image and this will result in the saints being slain. The slaying of the saints. So that's the dragon's program. How's he going to heal the deadly wound? Because this is where the deadly wound is healed. When he gives it breath and it speaks and the saints are put to death. So this is the war on the remnant here. This is what leads up to it. These are the steps that lead up to it. Great signs, even fire coming down from heaven in the sight of men. We okay? And once those great signs take place, it results in what Revelation's calling the setting up of an image to the beast. Step two. And once the image of the beast is set up, it's given breath. It's energized and empowered. This is what somebody mentioned a little while ago about civil and religious union. It comes to life and the saints who will not worship the image are put to death. And so there we've got the healing of the deadly wound. So you see what Revelation's doing in chapter 13? It's giving us the program, the three steps. These are crucial. So this is what leads into the second persecution, the war on the remnant. So what the Lord's saying is, when you see the second beast and you see great signs occurring, fire coming down from heaven, I'll deal with this in a moment. It's going to deceive the world. Inhabitants of the earth is going to be deceiving them, setting up an image of the beast. Now, fire from heaven. This is all in your notes. This is pretty comprehensively dealt with. Fire from heaven. Where do we get fire from heaven in the New Testament? We get it at Pentecost. Mm. Are we clear on this? Yeah. Fire coming down from heaven. What, what was the fire from heaven a sign of? The Holy Spirit's presence. Mm. Yeah? And here we've got the, the counterfeit of the Holy Spirit working. Mm. The great fire from heaven. There's going to be a counterfeit Pentecost. That's what mm. it's saying. And just as great signs accompanied the first century church right at the end of time, there's going to be a great outburst of signs. N n you've got a question, John? No? You're thinking. I can remember uh, the Fourth Testament came and it said, wait here. Uh, the sign that was written in the Gospel of Revelation 5. Before they put their Revelation 5 to come, when they received it, Pentecost comes down. So it's almost like a, a false It's going to be sold to us. Yeah, this is the real. Yeah. Now, I would like you to go, just so we're clear on this, go to Revelation chapter 16. Have a look at chapter 16 in your Bibles if you've got it. Chapter 16, 13, and 14. Most of this is in your notes, but I'm just going to reorganize to go through fairly quickly. 
chapter 16, 13 and 14. Could somebody read for us? And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now notice that. Three unclean spirits yeah. like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. And we've got the dragon here, yeah? Standing on the sea. Out of the mouth of the beast. And we've got that first beast with a wound. Mm -hmm. And then we've got this prophet. false prophet. It calls a false prophet. It's... It's the energized and empowered, I'll prove this later, but it's the energized and empowered image to the beast. And so out of them's coming these three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are the spirits of what? Demons performing what? Miracles and signs. Miracles and signs. To lead, to gather together the kings of the earth, the political powers of the earth for battle. And so these signs in Revelation chapter 13, chapter 13 and verse 13, occurring in the presence in by the first, second beast, we're clear, but it's going to spread in chapter 16, it becomes worldwide. Mm -hmm. And it's being performed by the spirits of demons, yeah. fallen angels. Those angels that were cast down to earth form an army that God sets, uh, that the dragon sets loose on the earth and we get this great outbursting of supernatural power and as you said, it's selling this as the work of the Holy Spirit. Very dangerous. So we'll start with the second beast which we will identify later as the United States but it starts there and then it spreads worldwide and becomes a movement for all of the political powers of the earth to fall under the control of the beast and its image. And so persecution will become worldwide. So that's the first step. Wait and look. When you see this happening in the States, you see this happening, and you see this great outburst, which will sweep the secular aspects of life and bring them all back to religious fervor, but you'll know it's on the basis of the miracles and the signs and the wonders that are being performed. And folks, you've got the first outpourings of this. It's starting today. You know, I used to watch when I was in Papua New Guinea, breakfast time, uh, about seven o'clock, on came, this is your day, Benny Hinn. And so normally it was switched on to Benny Hinn. <laughs> and I watched it. Now, I don't jump to conclusions quickly. I don't just say, ah! Because it's not SDA, it's of the devil. I'm not that naive, and so I watched him. For weeks I watched him, until one morning he came onto the stage and he said, he was getting agitated, he said, I feel the power, the power, it's burning in my bones, I feel the power. <laughs> and then he just went ballistic. He grabbed his coat and he started to swing his coat like this and the whole congregation was falling flat. You know, they call it slain in the spirit, huh? And then he was grabbing his workers and touching them and they're falling all over the place and kicking and jumping around. I thought to myself, Spirit of Christ? <laughs> and that's when I came to my conclusion on Benny Hinn. Not the Spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. But you've got the signs and the wonders movement that's going on in the world today and it's preparing the world for deception. Mm -hmm. You following this? Mm -hmm. If you trace it out, you just can trace it out. You find in the 60s, mm -hmm. what was once Pentecostal became the charismatic movement which began to infiltrate the Protestant churches, even Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And now after that period, you've got these neo-Pentecostal churches that have all spread up and developed and they're everywhere claiming that they can heal and they can perform miracles and signs and wonders. It's become a major movement in the Protestant world. And it's laying a foundation because people are attracted to it because they see power and they assume it's the power of God because they're told it's the power of God. And what I'm saying is, this is what we've got to be careful of because false Christ, false prophets performing great signs, if it were possible even to lead the very elect astray. Mm. You see, so close will be the counterfeit to the genuine. And so counterfeit Pentecost is where the dragon, using the spirits of demons, 
is going to be kicking off a program starting in one place and then rapidly spreading to become worldwide. And folks... Mm -hmm. This is development design. This won't happen suddenly. It'll be just a, a gradual layer by layer by layer. And people will not be aware of where it's going. Mm -hmm. oh, n n they're not aware of it. Yeah, but the thing is that there are too many being deceived. How are we going to help them? By knowing the Bible. Yeah, I mean... That's it. By knowing, by knowing... Uh, yes, I know. But the power of God will work amongst his people. Mm. But the counterfeit revival we'll see later kicks off first. Mm. And then comes the power of the latter rain. Mm. And it's clear in Revelation, mm. the order that it takes. Mm. Um, so is God alone the counterfeit revival? Now, let's move on. And let me see if I can quickly find the text I want. Go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, yeah here it is, it's on the bottom of page 4 of your notes, on the bottom of your notes on page 4, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14, and this is Paul talking, and he tells us how the devil works, huh? and this is what he said, these are key verses, mm -hmm. and what am I doing? And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as what? This is the bottom of page four. Disguising themselves as? Apostles of Christ. And notice the last part, verse 14. And no wonder... For even Satan disguises himself as what? Exactly. That's what he's doing here in Revelation chapter 13. Deceiving. Coming as an angel of light. Coming and presenting himself as the power of the Holy Spirit when it's really the spirits of demons behind the scenes working miracles. And the healings are being done in the name of Jesus. That's the deceptive part of it. And the world, who don't know Scripture, got no idea on Revelation, mm -hmm. fall into the trap. And they're swept along. And this results in a setting up of the image of the beast. Now, what is the image to the beast? You'll find this is in page 5. It talks about the image of the beast. What is the image of the beast? It's an image to the beast that was slain by the sword and yet lived which beast is that it's the first beast so he's going to set up an image to the first beast now what does it mean an image to the first beast it's going to set up an organization just like that mirrors or images the first one why not yeah but he's wounded He's wounded and these are steps he's taking towards the healing of the wound, the starting of the second period of persecution. Are we clear on this? And so this image of the beast, I think will come about, notice I said I think, will come about as a result of union of Protestant mm -hmm. churches. These are the seed of the woman. You following? Mm -hmm. But the rest of her offspring, her seed, they're the ones who don't get caught up in this. They stand apart from it mm -hmm. because they know the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so union of Protestant churches in the USA will lead to the formation of a state church. You following? Mm -hmm. Churches have tried to get together on the basis of doctrine and failed. They've been trying for... 80, 90, almost 100 years to get together on the basis of doctrine, but they can't because they don't agree. But when this happens, they'll come together on the basis of a common shared experience in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they'll come together and you'll get this united Protestant church formed and that Protestant church will take control of the government. You following? Civil power will come under the control of the religious power. And then it's set. We're into 
verse 15. Those who will not worship the image are put to death. If you don't receive the mark, and it doesn't say the mark of the image, but the mark of the beast. Well, it's going to be the second period of persecution. Exactly. Exactly. And so then we're into the war on the... We're onto the war on the remnant. We okay? We've seen a few things today, huh? Yeah. Okay, now what we'll do next week is we'll deal with the identity. I'll give you some ways to identify the second beast. Um, who is it? We've assumed it. But I'll give you the evidences. And then I might move on to this second period of persecution, verses 15 through to 17. And then we can look at the mark of the beast a bit later. We okay? Sorry, it takes a bit of diving around because we're trying to help you to see connections. Yeah, that's the point in it. So once you see the connections, it'll just start to jump out what Revelation's saying. And, and this, becomes, this becomes the measure for where we stand in the stream of this history. You following that? Not current events. Because what we do is we jump, take a text out of here and we throw it out into the world and we say, this is the fulfillment of it. See, there's all these rumours going around the moment about COVID-19 and then before that there were all these rumours about the last Pope. Remember this? <laughs> all this stuff just keeps boiling up, boiling up, boiling up and I just stand there and think to myself, please don't do this. Because we've done it all the way through our history. We try and make revelation fit current events rather than being clear on revelation and letting revelation enlighten current events. So where we are at the moment is we're at the time when the first drops, I think, the first drops of the counterfeit revival are starting. And they'll build up. It'll build up until we get a great outburst which will change the whole nature of the United States of America. Become fervently religious. Performance of great signs and great miracles. The whole of the country praising God for his power. You know, America has got a history of this. Because you've got what they call the first great awakening. 1700s and then the second great awakening in the late 1700s early 1800s and William Miller and Seventh-day Adventists grew out of the second great awakening we were right at the end of that second great awakening and suddenly out of that second great awakening came the Seventh-day Adventist church that's why we got a history of looking at the work of the Holy Spirit and we've got a history of focusing on the latter rain yeah this is common to Adventists. Yeah. It's because we're rooted in the second great awakening. Yeah, and true. we will be the ones who will lead into the third great awakening, mm. which is the outpouring of the latter rain, mm. which will be contrasted with the counterfeit revival. Mm. They'll be claiming this is the third great awakening. And we'll say, no, 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 it's not the third awakening <laughs> because God was bef behind the first two but there's another power at work behind this one. And when you have to stand up and face the religious world and say, we can't accept this, it's of the devil. Man, can you imagine calling the work of God the work of the devil? That's why knowing these verses in Revelation, this is going to be your protection, our protection. We say, well, it's not us who's saying this. I'm not saying this. The Bible saying it. Look at what it says and we go through chapter 12, we relate it to chapter 13, we see how the verses connect and we will, under the power of the Holy Spirit, have a testimony that the world can't refute. But it's knowing the word so that the Holy Spirit can use that word through us that really is a crucial point. 
God's in control. It, notice it says all the time, it was allowed, it was allowed, it was allowed. All right, folks, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer to close. And John, we can have some questions afterwards. Yeah. Father, we just pause again to thank you for the opportunity we've had this afternoon to study into your word. We thank you, Lord, for removing filters mm -hmm. from our thinking and enabling us to come closer and closer to what your word says. Mm -hmm. We ask you, Lord, to bless us during the week that lies ahead. Give us time to consolidate what we've been studying together mm -hmm. that we might be prepared to share with others, we pray in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm.